about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up. He said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guard and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. <laughs> When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, she said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. 
they now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Welcome to Acts. Christ's ministry continues. Acts has been called the fifth gospel, written by one of the gospel writers, Luke, a physician. Greg Harrell likes to call this book Dr. Luke's Book of Testimonies. It's the stories of the early church as they took the assignment given them by Jesus to preach the gospel everywhere and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything he commanded. This is how they function. This is an exciting chapter. I'd like to look at it in more detail. The dramatization was in the New International Version. I'm going to be reading it from the New King James Version. If you didn't bring your Bible, the text from today's sermon is in your bulletin along with the notes. It says, now about that time, what time? Well, it relates to the previous chapter that talks about a prophecy a church in Antioch received about great hunger and famine coming uh, to Judea. And we can pinpoint that pretty accurately via history when the price of wheat jumped. It's in the Roman history books. And so the church in Antioch, which was in the area now known as Syria, took up a huge offering and sent it to Judea, to Jerusalem, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now about that time before the, the famine hit, but at the time of the delivery of this big offering, Herod the king, Herod Agrippa I, Herod is a name uh, given to kings who ruled during the times of Rome over the Jewish people, kind of like Caesar or Pharaoh, not necessarily their personal name, but, but given to that position. Herod Agrippa I, they call him Agrippa the I, it was Agrippa the II, that later on in this book, Paul ministers and uh, quite effectively to the point that Agrippa II says, man, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. So Herod Agrippa I, his dad, uh, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Prior to this time, the church had experienced a few years of peace from persecution. Uh, the religious authorities had began ha harassing them only to see the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire because of persecution. And then to their dismay, one of their own, their leaders, Saul becomes an apostle. He becomes a believer. And so they kind of kicked back on the persecution because all they were doing was making it worse from their perspective. So Herod, a legal authority, takes up the cause of persecuting the Christians. And he kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now this is one of the 11 apostles. You know, Jesus appointed 12 to be apostles. One of them betrayed him and killed himself. So now they have 11 apostles. They appointed uh, Matthias to take Judas' place in Acts chapter 1. And now one of them is martyred. The first one is James. It's ironic to me that the last of the 11 to die, the only one to not die as a martyr, was John, his brother. So if we to line them up in a line in terms of their death, you'd have James on one side and John on the other. It kind of reminds me of their mother who approached Jesus. Hey, can my sons be on your right hand and your left in your kingdom? You know, I don't know that that was fulfilling of her wishes, but that's just my weird brain working. He saw that it pleased the Jews. He saw that, hey, they, these people were happy. I'm going to become popular. Now, these, these were Jewish unbelievers. The church was primarily Jewish in that area of the world. But the Jewish unbelievers who hated 
to see Jesus' ministry continue. We're happy. Hey, somebody's taking up the cause. Maybe this will be effective. So he proceeded to seize Peter also. Why? To kill him. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread, the old King James says Easter, uh, that's incorrect. It's the Greek word pascha, which refers to Passover, the day, the days of unleavened bread, which is part of the Passover festivities. So when he arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So, you know, we're not going to kill anybody during our religious holidays, but by golly, we sure will afterwards. Kind of like, I'm not going to cuss on Sunday. Well, why not? (laughs) It's God's day. No, every day is God's day. He's the first and the last. Amen? But this is the way religious people often can think. Somehow it's a Band-Aid to cover their wickedness. But meanwhile, God sees all and knows all. Therefore, verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, but constant prayer, that is fervent prayer, unceasing prayer was offered to God for him by the church. You reckon? You know, one of their leaders is gone, and here's another one's fixing to go, so they began to pray up a storm. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Boy, that seems like some extreme security measures, right? But in Acts 5, Peter had been in this same city delivered from prison. And the next morning, nobody knew where he was, and he was back preaching again. So they had to take extra precaution. There were like 16 soldiers guarding him 24-7. In this case, probably 24-3 or 4 um, even to the point of sleeping, sleeping in the same room, chained to him. But that's not too much for God, amen? Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, woke him up, and saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Verse 8, Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Get dressed, get ready, we're fixing to go. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate and at least to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately The angel departed from him. And then Peter had come to himself. He realized he wasn't dreaming. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. I get to live. Yes, God did it again. A few months ago in March, Brother Yoon whose biography is in a book called The Heavenly Man, uh, came to Granbury and spoke at the Way Church. And he shared how God had delivered him from prison twice, but in other occasions he didn't deliver him. The most amazing deliverance was the precautions that had been taken to keep him from escaping. In his case, he wasn't sleeping in a room with guards changed to him. In his case, they broke his legs to make sure he couldn't leave. And uh, one day he woke up, and the Lord just strongly impressed him. He was going to die if he didn't get out of there. So he prayed. He said, God, I can't leave. And the Lord impressed him. You're going to die unless you get out. So he thought, well, I, I got to try. And so he called the guard, says, I need to go to the bat. You know, I need to use the toilet. And so they unlocked his cell door, planning on sending someone to help him make his way to the latrine. This is in China. This man's still alive today. His residence is in Germany. And you can find videos of him online. And so uh, he hobbled his way through the door. No one was paying attention. So he painfully made his way on his broken legs to the next door. And that was open. No one was paying attention. He went through door after door until he's standing on the street. A car pulls up and he jumps in the car and says, I need for you to take me somewhere. And the car sped off. And he says, I'm going to pay you, but I need to get money from where we're going. And so he went to an apartment building uh, where some believers lived. 
and he hobbled his way up the steps, knocked on the door, and a little girl answered the door. And Brother you, we've been praying that God would set you free. There wasn't necessarily a prayer meeting going on at that time, but uh, they gave him some money. He made his way back to the, to the cab, to the car, and he realized he had been healed. Now, later he wound up back in jail and even in another country, and the Lord delivered him another way through legal means, and it was a, another painful process. The book of Acts is full of stories like this. There's riot and revival. There's disappointment and ecstasy, agony and wonders. So here they are planning the funeral for James and rejoicing at the deliverance of Peter. Isn't that, isn't that kind of the Christian life? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And together we move forward in victory. Amen? So, he knew he wasn't sleeping. So when he considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So, this Mary was the mama of John Mark, who becomes a character in the book, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. She got so excited, she forgot to let him in, but ran in and announced that Peter was outside. They said to her, you're beside yourself. But she kept insisting that it was so. So they said it is his angel. They just couldn't believe it. Asking God for things and can't believe that he came through. And why did they say it was his angel? Well, it's believed then and even by some now, that everybody has a guardian angel, and the guardian angel looks just like the person they're guarding. So he must be dead, you know. Um, his angel's at the door. So Peter continued knocking, verse 16, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> Great people of faith, aren't they? Isn't God awesome that our faith does not have to be uh, dishonest, that our faith does not have to be perfect or pretended, that we can be real, that we don't have to say, I don't have a cold. If you're sick, you're sick. You don't have to say you're not sick. You can be honest. They were astonished. What? The world God heard our prayers. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, Y'all quieten down. I'm in danger here. He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Now, who is James? He's the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And to the brethren, who were they? They were the other church leaders. Look at this. Here are church members meeting for prayer in the middle of the night, and there's no officials there. How dare they? If you've been part of a church where you are forbidden to have meetings in your home that have anything to do with the ministry that Jesus wants to continue, you need to change churches. And if your meetings have become go gossip sessions, repent. Repent. Confront. Somebody speak up and say, hey, we're going south with this conversation. We need to stop. Let's pray. It's controlling of leadership to forbid people to use their homes to further the ministry of the gospel because somebody might sin. I heard of one church, they didn't want any phone books because people might call each other and talk bad about one another. <laughs> so what if they do? Maybe the Holy Spirit will convict them and they'll repent and actually do something nice for the person that annoys the heck out of them. Back to the sermon. This was a house being used mightily used, right? There's people in this church that use their houses and their places of business for meetings that I don't know anything about. That's fine with me, man. Get the word out. But sometimes I hear about these things and I'm interested because it's exciting to me that we are a church full of ministers. Look at your bulletin. Who are the ministers in the church? All the members. So get busy, saints. I'm going to interview a couple of people that are using their houses 
in the past and currently for stuff. Lori and Lois. Can you all come on up here? Lori? So you're hosting bi-weekly meetings in your house or weekly or monthly? Every, what a, other, every other Thursday. You doing this by yourself? No, Sean Ferris is teaching. Wow, team ministry. So you and Sean teamed up. Yes. And invited women in your neighborhood. Yep. We live out in Pecan, and Sean teaches Pilates, and we decided two years ago to open up the, our, my home to invite the women from Pilates to come and do a Bible study after, after we exercise. That's awesome. Yeah, so we've been doing it about a year and a half now. So do you ever pray for sore muscles or pray for needs? Or? <laughs> we do pray. We do pray a lot. That's great. Know. That's wonderful. Yeah. Great. Lois? Yeah, I know you've used your home for church things officially, just like Lori has, but this on your own, are you doing anything like this in your house? Uh, yes, last summer we started a, uh, a Bible study, and uh, three different ladies opened their homes, so we traveled. We went different places each week. We had about um, 30 people at the most came. We have a size that big. And we did Bible study. We had prayer at the end. It was great. It's good fellowship. We ate together. People brought potluck. It was good. That's great. And uh, currently, I've got a little small group that's uh, meeting in my house. I know you mentioned one time in, in service that um, the best way to mentor someone is to have them come and ask to be mentored, and that happened here. Someone came up and, and uh, asked me about uh, talking with them, and it led to a little Bible study, and we have it in the house every uh, Thursday. Right, so do you pray and stuff? We pray. We read That's the awesome. Word. We rejoice together. We weep together. Yeah. It's good. That's great. Encouraging. Awesome. That's great. During this series on another Lord's Day sermon, uh, Josh Snodgrass, who's doing children's church today, uh, was interviewed. He does a weekly Bible study uh, going through books of the Bible at work during lunch once a week. He has unbelievers. Even a Muslim comes. The reason he comes, he's interested in marrying a Christian gal, so he's coming, and Josh is getting to getting to share the gospel with him. So you have been assigned by the Great Commission to go into all the world. That's to all of us. And preach the gospel to all the creatures. Well, isn't there a separation between the clergy and the laity? No, there's not. Jesus took down the wall of separation. This religious professional thing is what has hurt the church for centuries. If you don't believe it, look at Europe. The spiritual graveyard, like 4% Christian max because of that. The church that is alive is one where people go beyond church buildings. I hated that we had to build a church building. We were in temporary locations for years and kept running out of places to go. And thank the Lord, the Lord was leading us to buy property, get ready. Eventually, we were going to run out of places to go. And we wound up in a school for a month before we were able to use this place. But it's all about us being effective wherever we are for him. And it can even use our homes. Just like in this story, this prayer meeting, praying up a storm for Peter, the prayer gets answered and they don't even believe it. <laughs> God will take a help and use it for his glory. So do not think your prayers do not count because you don't have flowery language. He hears the earnest, sincere prayer of the righteous. Amen? Now, back to Herod. Then as soon as it was day, verse 18, there was no small stir among the soldiers, oops, you reckon, about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards, called them in for some serious questioning, and commanded that they should be put to death. What a mean guy. Well, this was more than meanness. This was actually the fulfillment of their custom. If you were assigned to guard someone and you let that guy escape, you got his sentence. So this was another proof that Peter was a dead man. There was a dotted line on his neck. If God hadn't intervened. So what does Herod do? He has them killed and then he leaves town. He stops harassing the church. It's too much trouble. And leaves Judea and goes to Caesarea, which is on the coast, a nice place. 
and stays there. Now, Herod had been angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. That's another region under his domain. But they came to him with one accord. They united and began to appeal to his authority for mercy, having made Blastus, his personal aide, their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So they didn't want to go hungry. So, verse 21, on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, this was during a a festival honoring the emperor, he sat on his throne and gave an oration to them, a beautiful speech. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man, the voice of a God and not of a man, the voice of a God and not of a man. They just kept shouting this. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. He didn't stop them. And what happened? The people saw that he was mortal. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, for years I've worked in children's ministry. I can't read this without thinking of children memorizing stuff. I can hear little kids in my head He was eaten by worms and died, but the word of God grew and multiplied. He was eaten by worms and died, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Everybody, he was eaten by worms and died, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Or else, a hush. (laughs) Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, this story of the death of Herod, Agrippa I, the first, is corroborated by the historian Josephus, who lived during this period of history. And uh, in fact, a lot of his writings are quite interesting to read. And they were translated years ago. So he didn't write in King James English, just the translation reads like King James English. This is what he had to say about the death of Herod in his book. His full name was Flavius Josephus, and he wrote volumes of antiquities or history of Israel, Judea. said, when Agrippa had reigned three years over all Judea, he came to the city of Caesarea. Well, we know why, right? There he exhibited shows in honor of the emperor. So he showed off the Roman Empire to the people. On the second day of the festival, Herod put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a truly wonderful contexture, and came into the theater early in the morning with this beautiful garment on, at which time the silver of his garment was eliminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it. So it's kind of like twilight, but here's the sun shining, and here's this glowing guy in front of him. It shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread a horror over those that looked intently upon him. At that moment, his flatterers cried out that he was a god, and they added, Be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. They were worshiping him. Upon this, the king did neither rebuke them, nor reject their impious flattery. But as he presently afterward looked up, he saw an owl sitting on a certain rope over his head and immediately understood that this owl was the messenger of ill tidings. Uh Uh-oh, bad omen. A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. He therefore looked upon his friends and said, Whom you call a God, am commanded presently to depart this life. While providence thus reproves the lying words you just now said to me, I, who was by you called immortal, am immediately to be hurried away by death. He was carried into the palace. Keep in mind, I'm just reading excerpts. There's even more here. And the rumor went abroad that he would certainly die in a little time. But the multitude sat in sackcloth with their wives and children after the law of their country and besought God for the king's recovery. So everybody's repenting. All places were also full of mourning and lamentation. 
Now the king rested in a high chamber, and as he saw them below lying prostrate on the ground, he could not himself forbear weeping. He couldn't stop crying. And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life, being in the 54th year of his age, the seventh year of his reign. So God gave him a space to repent through this slow, agonizing death. Isn't that amazing? When you keep in mind the church is praying constantly, you know they're not just saying, Lord, deliver Peter, Lord, deliver Peter. No, they're praying for James' family, and they're praying about King Herod. Lord, do something about Herod. So this was God answering their prayers. Back to Brother Yoon, the guy in China. His uh, story of being in prison in Burma is really a horrible thing. And there he's in this prison full of people that are not believers, and they begin to persecute him to the point of defecating on him. He should die from the stuff he went through. And his large cell got hit with a skin disease. Everybody had unbelievable rashes except him. The unsanitary stuff that they were doing to him, God used to protect him. (laughs) And they left him alone. So here, the Christians are left alone again for a while. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject, keys to effective prayer. Can we say effective? Keys to effective prayer. This is not a recipe, you know, do step one and step two and then step three and then you'll be guaranteed answers to prayer. No, our prayers are effective because prayer changes things. Amen? Often, first of all, starting with changing us. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Effective prayers must be continuous. You just keep on praying. Keep on asking. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Continues, rejoice evermore. In everything give thanks. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Our prayer should be offered to God. Now, it's preached by some in some rather large denominations in the world that we can pray to to those who are dead because they're not dead, they're with God. And we know that in heaven we're like God. So if we're like God, then we must be omniscient, that is all-knowing. We must be omnipresent, that is everywhere. And we must be omnipotent. That is all powerful. So you can pray to people because God's so busy. Let's talk to some dead folks because they're not dead. Jesus didn't pray that way. He didn't pray to Moses. He prayed all night long to God, and we understand he was God. In Luke 6 12, he continued all night in prayer to God. We pray to God. Because God knows what we're dealing with. He knows what it feels like. And even though one day we will be like him, we will never be him. Tell your neighbor, you'll never be God. Now, Hebrews says we have a high priest who is easily touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows what we go through. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet he did not sin. I understand in the medical profession, sometimes to train people in how to care for the elderly, they have them wear an aging suit for a few hours. An aging suit is, uh, one of them is called the R70i. It sounds like some high-tech thing. What it is is a set of coveralls that's really hard to move around in, painful on your joints, and hard to stand up straight when you're wearing this thing. It includes goggles that impairs your vision and earplugs that impairs your hearing and gloves and shoes that impairs your feeling and makes you feel disconnected from the world. And when you wear this for a while, you're told this is what it feels like to be 100 years old. Having experienced that, you become a much better medical technician in caring for those needing geriatric care. 
That's what Jesus did for us. He came and wore an earth suit for 30 three and a half years. He knows what it's like to be human. He's a high priest who's easily touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and he told us to pray to the Father in his name. Well, my prayers aren't being answered, so I'm going to try out Christopher for a while. You better be careful. You might get some demon intervening in your prayers. You pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and trust God to bring you the answer. In the meantime, pursue the Lord and his will for your life. Do not be distracted by shortcuts that actually are not shortcuts. You don't need somebody else to pray for you. Jesus is your intercessor, amen? Amen. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, not anybody else. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You want the peace of God? Let God know your needs. He knows them anyway, but by telling him, you're acknowledging he is God and you are not. Effective praying needs to be specific. They weren't praying, oh God, please be with Peter. He's already with them. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you're asking him to do what he's already doing. You know, oh God, please be God. Thank him for being God. Thank him for being with Peter in that jail cell. But don't be asking him to do things that are already done. That's based on fear that your prayer is not going to be answered. Now, often our prayers are not answered like we think they should be, but they are answered in light of the agenda that God has for us. And what is that agenda? That we are all conformed, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. God's agenda is to make you and I like his son. So that one day you'll wear that heaven suit, amen? Jesus said in Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Knock! Be specific. For everyone who asks, that is a repetitive thing, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. This is an expression of faith, continual asking. He continues, what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? Tell somebody, ask him. Be specific about it. Our praying needs to be with others. This isn't just a personal thing, but this is a corporate thing that we join with prayer for one another. The Lord willing, at the end of this service, we'll have a time for prayer with the prayer team. They'll come up, line up across the front to pray prayers of agreement based on these scriptures for anyone that needs to pray with someone. This church was praying together in houses constantly, and Peter interrupts one of these meetings to reveal their prayer had been answered. Ladies, read this together. All right, men, read the same verse together. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Everybody together, verse 20. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Matthew 18, 20. Now, often this verse is quoted to comfort those who are discouraged by a low turnout for a Christian event. Well, the Lord's here. No, this is a commission to pray together. It's in the context. To me, it's a promise that the prayers are more powerful when prayed with other people. Why? Well, God likes to see us dwell in unity, but also we help one another another be more biblical because it's possible to pray self-centered prayers It's possible to try to use the Bible as some type of witchcraft manual. (laughs) And it's possible to get discouraged in our prayers. So when we pray together prayers of agreement, we encourage one another. We help one another be more accurate. We help one another remember the things we're asking so that when God answers, we give him the glory. 
As a kid, I grew up hearing people request prayer because they were sick, and then when they were healed, I would hear them say, must have been a 24-hour virus. Like, man, would you people pray together so you can remind one another, wait a minute, we ask God to heal us. Let's give him the glory, amen? Yeah. Well, thank you, Lord, for 24-hour viruses. No, sorry. I better be nice. Our praying needs to be with others, with other people. Praying must be a part of our home life, not just a church building thing, not just a first day of the week thing or a seventh day thing, but a 24-7 thing, part of the culture of our homes and our houses. It can be with our families. It can be with our children. It can be with our grandchildren. Some, something neat. You don't have to have a full-blown church service and, you know, praying the paint off the walls so the poor grandkids hate God. No, but you acknowledge God in your family and make sure prayer is part of your culture where they remember grandma prayed, grandpa prayed, mama prayed, daddy prayed. Look what happened. Part of our home life. Peter came to the house of Mary where many were gathered together praying. Could have been packed out praying, encouraging one. Keep in mind, they were surprised. (laughs) What are the results of praying effectively? Prayers are answered, right? Uh, Faith is strengthened. Hope is renewed. We know we're not alone. Results of effective prayer uh, says that they avail much. A lot of good happens. James 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What were some of the things that happened as a result of John Mark's mama's prayer meeting at her house? Well, I'm sure they were praying for James' family. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. It's true. But we do know that John came through the season of mourning and during the course of his ministry wrote five books in the New Testament that are very encouraging to us today. Thank God for this prayer meeting. And we do know how, know how church life goes, man. Somebody dies, we encourage each other. We pray together. There's a time to die and there's a time to be born. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh, a time to rejoice. There's a time for everything. And so no doubt they were praying for this family as well. And this family was praying, Lord, have mercy on Peter. Simon Peter's delivered from jail, not just jail, but death. Their evil enemy is removed publicly in such a way that according to Josephus, man, people are fasting and praying for mercy. The son of the prayer meeting hostess goes with Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip. When we are people of prayer, our children are impacted. They just are, just the way it is. And what does John Mark do? He grows up and blesses us all by writing a biography of Jesus that we call the Gospel of Mark with Simon Peter's help. My final point is prayer changes things starting with the one who prays. I do not lift myself up on a pedestal as the world's greatest example of prayer, but I can say that prayer changes things starting with us. Back in 1985, I started a church with my wife saying, are you sure God told us to do this? Hey, I like the story better this way. And she did her best to help me, okay? Because my response was persuaded her for a time. God called me to preach. I'm not getting any invitations, so bless God, we're going to start a place and invite folks to come. So I prayed and prayed and prayed for God to bless that effort. Two and a half years later, the Lord led us, sovereignly led us to shut it down. Changed me. And here we are 30 years later. 
would not be here were it not for God answering prayer by changing me. The day after we closed the church, Church on the Rock sent a rider truck and filled it up with all of our church stuff. In two and a half years, it was amazing the things we had as a, as a little congregation. Filled it up and hauled it to the Cedar Creek Lake area where they had rented a John Deere store to start a church. And we fully furnished a church plant minus a drum set. I've often wondered, whatever came of them? They're not in the John Deere store anymore. Did they close? What happened? Well, a couple months ago, we laid hands on Dell and Chris Kennedy and officially sent them out to become pastor of Living Word Church in Kent, Texas. And one day I got the opportunity, opportunity to accompany Dale to Kemp, Texas, to Living Word Church, where they're now pastoring. They're there this morning. And I noticed two blocks from there was another church called River of Life. I called them last week. I said, you don't know who I am, but I'm Alan Ladder. I pastor in Granbury, Texas for the last 26 years. Uh, 30 years ago, we closed a church and fully furnished a church plant by Church on the Rock in the Cedar Creek Lake area. And the secretary said, that's us. I've been a member here for 30 years. We just celebrated our 30-year anniversary. Our pastor lives here on the grounds. We're doing very well. She gave just a glowing report of the church. Now, to somebody else, that, that's like, okay, cool. Strange coincidence. You know, the Kennedys are there from our church, and then uh, this stuff is there from Pastor Lattice Church way a long time ago. Well, the stuff isn't there anymore. They wound up giving that stuff away over the years to help other churches get started. But to me, this was my dream I gave away in the hands of God for him to do with what he wills to do. You do not know how God has answered some of your prayers that you think are unanswered, some of the disappointments that you surrendered your life into the hands of God. You do not know what he's done with your prayers and your surrenders that you may discover 30 years from now. Who knows? But I share that to encourage you that prayer changes things starting with us. And it's God's will that if we are to continue the ministry of Jesus, that we continue praying because it includes prayer. Last Sunday, we shared about the painting that Leonardo da Vinci did. Remember me sharing about that? It's in Milan, and it was a monastery in the dining room and what's strange about this is the detail Leonardo da Vinci went to that relate to the Last Supper. Now, we know the original Last Supper, they weren't sitting at a table uh, on chairs. They're sitting on the floor on probably some type of low-type low table. So it didn't look like this. They certainly weren't posing for a photograph. They're around the table. But the story is reflected in this. You have... Uh, people asking one another, is it I? Because in this painting, the Lord had just said, one of you is going to betray me. Peter asking John, hey, uh, who is it? And there's Judas in front of Peter, looking rather uh, guilty, kind of uh, in the dark there. You have Peter carrying a knife. Remember what that relates to, his sword. You have Jesus' hand extended towards the bread. Remember, he instituted the Lord's table and towards the cup. But what is this thing where Jesus' feet should be? What is that? Well, if you tour there, you will see that after the painting was a couple hundred years old, it was starting to fade. The monks in their dining hall decided they needed a shortcut to the kitchen. Who knows? Monks need the food as fast as they can. They live with such self-denial anyway as it is. If there's any Catholics in the house, please know I'm not making fun. <laughs> this is creating humor. So they created a shortcut by cutting a doorway through the feet of Jesus to get to the kitchen. To me, that is a powerful metaphor that speaks to me. The doorway to ministry, the doorway to God's kitchen 
is in recognizing that we are the hands and feet of Jesus, that we are the extension. We are the, he is the head and we are his body. And one of the things we do as his hands and feet is praying. One of the songs we sang this morning is entitled, Do It Again. And to me, it's kind of the words of an intercessor that's crying out to God with needs and the prayers aren't getting answered instantly. And it says, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you've never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you've never failed me yet. Man, that's awesome lyrics. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me in your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that we would be encouraged as believers to pray like never before. Honest prayers, biblical prayers, prayers alone and prayers with other believers. Prayers in public, prayers in private, prayers in our closet, prayers in our living room, prayers with our family and prayers with our neighbors and our coworkers. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you hear prayers. And Lord, as we have a time of prayer here at the end of the service. I pray, Lord, that you would make a way for people to receive prayer if they need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please don't leave if you have a need.